This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. If you click on the link in the description below, it'll take you to their store and they'll know I sent you there. Hi everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and today we're finishing up the Strixhaven Limited set review. So far I've looked at all the cards apart from the colorless ones and the blue, red, and black, white multicolored cards, and today, well, we're going to look at those remaining cards. Keep in mind that in this review I'm only talking about the limited formats that's draft and sealed. I won't be talking about things like Standard or Commander. I conclude my evaluation of each of these cards with a letter grade that sort of sums up my thoughts about the card. If you're new to my set reviews, there's an explanation of what each grade means in the description of this video. Alright, let's get started. We're going to get started looking at the Prismari cards, in other words, the blue-red ones, and we're looking first at Creative Outburst, which for three generic, two blue, and two red is an uncommon instant, and it deals five damage to any target. Look at the top five cards of your library, put one of them into your hand and the rest in the bottom of your library in a random order, and you can pay two blue-red hybrid mana and discard it to create a treasure token. This seems good. It's expensive, but because it lets you discard it to make a treasure early, part of that downside is mitigated against. Casting this will feel really good, as doing 5 damage to something and drawing a card chosen from among 5 is a really good deal. Blue-Red is all about big spells like this, so it fits right in, while also supporting the archetype's ability to cast those spells in the first place. I think that makes this a pretty good uncommon, giving it a B-. Next up, it's Culmination of Studies, which for X, a blue, and a red is a rare sorcery, and it says exile the top X cards of your library. For each land card exiled this way, create a treasure token. For each blue card exiled this way, draw a card. For each red card exiled this way, a Culmination of Studies deals one damage to each opponent. This has a cool design, and it's one that is a bit challenging to get a handle on without playing with it. Blue-red is all about having a bunch of mana, so pumping significant mana into X will be easier than it would be in most formats. So... The lands give you treasure, and that will make it easier for you to cast the spells you draw for blue cards that you hit. Red cards damage the opponent, and sometimes this will just be able to close them out. But how much mana do you need to spend to feel like this is working out for you? Well, if you pay 6 total mana and exile 4 cards, there's a good chance you'll get, like, a treasure, draw a card, and do 2 to your opponent, and that's not very good for 6 mana. I think the main plan with this is to really have it be a win condition in the late game when you have a ton of mana, which blue-red can produce, but that also means it's pretty terrible in the early game. Overall, I don't think I like this a whole lot for limited. I think there's better win conditions for blue-red out there. I'm giving this a D. Next up, it's Elemental Expressionist, which costs 4 blue-red hybrid mana. It's a 4-4 Orc Wizard at rare. It's got Magecraft, which means you get some sort of effect anytime you cast or copy an instant or sorcery. In this case, a target creature gains. If this creature would leave the battlefield, exile it instead of putting it anywhere else. And when you exile this creature, create a 4-4 Blue and Red Elemental Creature token. This has good stats to begin with, and then it has a really wordy Magecraft trigger that basically makes it so if a creature you target leaves the battlefield one way or another, you get a 4-4 Elemental. It can target itself with this, and note also that you can cast an instant to make this trigger happen in response to a removal spell or other things. This is a very scary threat of activation type card, and you can also just use it up front and then attack with the thing when your opponent has to block the creature, at which point you're getting a two for one. It is a little bit situational, but because it can target itself and there's lots of spells in this format, not insanely so. I think you can first pick this pretty happily. I'm giving it a B+. Next up, it's Elemental Masterpiece, which costs 5 generic, a blue, and a red for a common sorcery. It creates two 4-4 blue and red elemental creature tokens, and you can pay two blue-red hybrid mana and discard it to make a treasure token. Late, this gives you two 4-4 bodies fairly efficiently, and it can actually make you treasure early too, giving you both fixing and ramp. That makes this way better because it isn't just a straight-up blank card until the late game. This is a C. Next up, it's Elemental Summoning, which for 3 generic and 2 blue-red hybrid mana is a common sorcery lesson, and it makes a 4-4 blue and red elemental creature token. So, lessons are something that you pair with cards that have learn. Cards that have learn let you look in your sideboard for a lesson and put it into your hand. This is another lesson that you wouldn't really ever want to main deck, as a 5-mana 4-4 just isn't very good these days, but being able to draw this when you learn sounds pretty good. So, you should value this a little higher, thanks to being a lesson. It's a D-plus in your main deck, and a C-plus if you wish for it. Next up, it's Expressive Iteration, which for a blue and a red is an uncommon sorcery, and it says, look at the top three cards of your library, put one of them into your hand, put one of them on the bottom of your library, and exile one of them. You may play the exiled card this turn. 
This has a really cool design. Basically, you draw one card from your top three and you exile another that you can cast until the end of turn. So this is sort of a two-mana divination, albeit one that is somewhat time-sensitive. Note, though, that it does let you play lands from exile. So you can even cast this on, like, turn three, exile a land in your top three and put something else in your hand, and then play that land right away. Because you get to choose, there really is a reasonable chance you will get two cards out of this, even fairly early. It is a sorcery, which makes it a little slower, but this is close enough to two cards for two mana that I think I'm down for first picking it sometimes. I'm giving it a B-. Next up, it's Galazeth Prismari, which for two generic, a blue and a red, is a 3-4 legendary Elder Dragon at Mythic Rare. It's got flying. When it enters the battlefield, you make a treasure token, and artifacts you control have tap. Add one mana of any color. Spend this mana only to cast an instant or sorcery spell. So Prismari, as we've seen, is all about casting big spells, and Galazeth definitely makes that even clearer. A 4-mana 3-4 with flying that gives you a treasure is already a great card. It has good stats and helps you fix and ramp, adding the additional upside that all of your artifacts, including other treasures, can now tap for mana of any color to cast spells, and you're looking at something pretty nice. I think he sneaks into the lower bomb range of giving him an A-. Next up, it's Maelstrom Muse, which costs one generic, a blue, a blue-red hybrid mana, and one red mana, and it's a 2-4 Jin Wizard at Uncommon. It's got flying, and when it attacks, the next instant or sorcery spell you cast this turn costs X less to cast, where X is Maelstrom Muse's power as this ability resolves. It's pretty nice that this can decrease the cost of your spells by two mana, even on its own it can do that. And that's in addition to actually having pretty nice stats for the cost. You won't always be able to take advantage of that mana reduction, but blue-red is all about big spells, so it will probably come up more than you might think. Next up, it's Magma Opus, which for 6 generic, a blue and a red is a mythic rare instant. It does 4 damage divided as you choose among any number of targets. It also taps 2 target permanents, makes a 4-4 blue and red elemental creature token, and draws you 2 cards, and... You can also pay two blue-red hybrid mana to discard it and make a treasure token. This has a really cool design. It's obviously hugely powerful if you play it late, but at eight mana, a card like this can be a liability in some games, just stuck in your hand forever. But if that's how things are going, you can always cash it in for some treasure, and oftentimes if you get it early, that will just be the right thing to do. Making sure to have a way to get it back later will really make that sweet, but either way, this card has the flexibility to provide mana and fixing early, and then in the late game, it has an effect that will win a significant number of games. I have to say that for 8 mana, it isn't actually quite as powerful as you might expect, but it probably had to be balanced a little bit since it wasn't useless in the early game like most hugely powerful expensive spells. I kind of want to give this a bomb grade, but I think it falls a little bit short. Even with blue-red decks being really into high-costed spells, I'm giving this a B+. Next up, it's Ogyar Battleseer, which for three generic, a blue and a red is a 3-4 Ogre Shaman at common. It's got haste, and you can tap it to scry one. This is all right. It has mediocre stats and haste, and while tapping to scry is good, I don't think it's enough to be anything special. I don't imagine your deck will have room for this most of the time. I'm giving it a C-. Next up, it's Practical Research, which for three generic, a blue and a red is an uncommon instant, and it says draw four cards, then discard two cards unless you discard an instant or sorcery card. This is pretty close to being Reign of Reflection, and that's a great card draw spell for limited. Sometimes you won't want to discard the instant or sorcery, especially if you ended up with a couple of lands you don't need, but you still end up seeing a lot of cards for a reasonable cost, and importantly, at instant speed. I think you can take this with a first pick in some weaker packs. I'm giving it a B-. Next up, it's Prismari Apprentice, which costs a blue and a red for a 2-2 human shaman at uncommon. It's got Magecraft. In this case, it can't be blocked. And if the spell had a mana value 5 or greater, you get a plus and plus 1 counter on Prismari Apprentice. Being unblockable anytime a spell is cast isn't too shabby and would already make for a pretty good card, but the fact it gains plus and plus 1 counters when you cast big spells really makes this into a nice signpost in common for blue-red, and one I think you'll first pick in some weaker packs. Keep in mind, as exciting as that trigger seems, you're not going to get that plus and plus 1 counter usually more than a couple of times, which is still really good, but just don't expect this to get huge like some creatures who trigger every time you cast any spell. Anyway, I'm giving this a B-. Next up, it's Prismari Command, which for one generic, a blue and a red is a rare instant, and it says choose two, deal two damage to any targets, draw two cards and discard two cards, or create a treasure token, or destroy target artifact. This is pretty good. Most often, you're probably going to do two damage to something and loot twice, and that's a card that's already great. The other two abilities are more narrow. You won't always want treasure, and your opponent won't always have an artifact, but that's the beauty of modal spells. You have a solid choice when those narrow effects don't line up well, but when they do, this will feel even better. I'm giving this a B. 
Next up, it's Prismari Pledge Mage. It's for two blue-red hybrid mana. It's a 3-3 Orc Wizard at common. It's got Defender, and it has Magecraft, and it loses Defender when you trigger it. We've seen a lot of creatures like this over the last few years. Two mana 3-3s three with Defender that can gain the ability to attack one way or another. The initial body is actually pretty good at helping you block on the ground, and once you can get it to attack, it will feel even better. Now, you do have to find a way to trigger Magecraft most turns for this to really be at its best, and that won't be easy. This seems decent enough to me, though. I'm giving it a C. Next up, it's Rutha, Mercurial Artist, which for one generic, a blue and a red is a 1-4 legendary orc shaman at uncommon. You can pay two generic to return her to your hand, and she copies target instant or sorcery spell you control. You may choose new targets for the copy. I don't love this compared to the rest of this cycle. It's nice that it helps you copy spells repeatedly, but it is pretty clunky at doing it. You pay a total of 5 mana every time to copy a spell, and sure, you pay it in installments, so just having 2 mana around to copy a spell is all you need to do on a specific turn, but you really can't overlook the mana investment this will constantly require. Now, copying really big spells with this might be where your mind goes, but even with treasure, having the extra mana to do that is far from guaranteed. Still. At the same time, you will have the extra mana to copy cheap spells pretty often because of treasure. It just seems like it's going to be too slow at copying spells to really be anything you want to take super early. I'm giving it a C+. Next up, it's Spectacle Mage, which for one generic, a blue and a red is a 2-2 bird shaman at common. It's got flying and instant and sorcery spells you cast with mana value 5 or greater cost 1 less to cast. So this is a wind drake with some nice upside for blue-red, a color pair that we've seen a lot of already and it likes big spells. This seems like a key common for that deck. I'm giving it a C+. Next up, it's Teach by Example, which for two blue-red hybrid mana is a common instant. And it says whenever you cast your next instant or sorcery spell this turn, copy that spell, you may choose new targets for the copy. I know this format is all about spells and stuff, and blue-red has lots of big spells to copy, but I still have a hard time thinking a card like this will be worthwhile. You have to line it up the right way for it to do something. And sure, using it on something like a draw spell or removal will feel pretty sweet, as well copying some of the huge wacky spells in blue-red in general, but it still seems like the setup is too much. This kind of spell isn't good in most limited formats, and I don't think it will be here either, giving it a D. All right, now we're moving to the modal double-faced cards for blue-red. Remember, these are a little different than some older double-faced cards. They don't transform into one another. You choose one side or the other, and that's the one you cast, and that's how it comes into play. In this case, we have Rowan Scholar of Sparks and Will Scholar of Frost, both of which are legendary planeswalkers. And they have the same static ability, instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one less to cast. Rowan costs two generic and a red. She starts with two loyalty and she has a plus one that deals one damage to each opponent. If you've drawn three or more cards this turn, she does three damage to each opponent instead. And her ultimate is a minus four. It gives you an emblem with whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, you may pay two. If you do copy that spell, you may choose new targets for the copy. Will, meanwhile, costs four generic and a blue, has a plus one, and it starts with four loyalty, and he has a plus one that says up to one target creature has base power and toughness zero two until your next turn, a minus three that says draw two cards, and a minus seven that says exile up to five target permanents. For each permanent exile this way, its controller creates a 4-4 blue and red elemental creature token. This is a cool double-faced planeswalker. They both have a nice static ability and loyalty abilities, but I definitely think that the Will Scholar of Frostside will be better and limited. His plus one helps protect him from your opponent's best creature. You can use his minus three right away to draw cards, and his ultimate can turn your lands into 4-4 creatures, which can be pretty great. Rowan is a lot cheaper, but also far more fragile. Her plus one loyalty ability will just do one damage to an opponent most of the time, and she has no way to protect herself or draw you cards, really. Her ultimate kind of helps you draw cards, I guess, in the sense you copy a spell, but I just don't see her coming down on turn three and getting to do her thing real often. Will is definitely more powerful, and I think with that side alone, he'd probably be close to a bomb. I think adding the flexibility of also being Rowan when that matters is enough for this to be an A-. minus. Next, it's Torrent Sculptor, which for two generic and two blue is a rare merfolk wizard. It's got Ward 2, which means whenever it becomes a target of a spell or an ability an opponent controls, it's countered unless they pay two. And when Torrent Sculptor enters the battlefield, you exile an instant or sorcery card from your graveyard. Put a number of plus and plus one counters on Torrent Sculptor equal to half that card's mana value rounded up. The other side is Flamethrower Sonata, which for one generic and a red is a rare sorcery. And it says discard a card, then draw a card. When you discard an instant or sorcery card this way, Flamethrower Sonata deals damage equal to that card's mana value to target creature or planeswalker you don't control. 
Neither side of this is overwhelmingly powerful, but they're both pretty good and have their uses. Blue-red has a lot of big spells, so sometimes you'll be able to make the Sculptor into a pretty scary creature, especially if you discarded one to make treasure in the early game. It also has Ward, which makes it significantly harder to kill, but I think counting on more than a couple of plus and plus one counters will be a mistake most of the time. Meanwhile, the Sonata side rummages and can turn most cards you discard into a removal spell, and that's something I can get behind, though of course sometimes you won't be able to do anything meaningful with it, and that will be rough. Still, they're both pretty powerful, they both have their uses, I think this is something you first pick sometimes, I'm giving it a B-. Next, it's Uvilda, Dean of Protection, who for two generic and a blue is a 2-2 legendary gin wizard at rare. She can tap, and you may exile an instant or sorcery card from your hand and put three hone counters on it. It gains at the beginning of your upkeep if this card is exiled, remove a hone counter from it. When the last hone counter is removed from this card, if it's exiled, you may cast it. It costs four mana less to cast this way. The other side is Nasari, Dean of Expression, who for three generic and two red is a 4-4 legendary Ifrit Shaman at rare. And it says at the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top card of each opponent's library. Until end of turn, you may cast spells from among those exiled cards, and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast those spells. And whenever you cast a spell from exile, Nasari gets a plus one plus one counter. This whole Dean cycle is really good. I think the lowest grade I'm giving to any of them is a B+. Plus. All of them have pretty good cards on both sides. Some of them are straight up bombs. Anyway, Uvilda's ability to let you pay less for your spells will probably be better than it looks, just like Suspend often is, but I still feel like it's a pretty darn slow effect. But it will reduce the cost of a spell and make it easier to double spell in a few turns, and if you can reduce the cost of one of the big 7 or 8 mana spells, It'll feel really good. Nasari, though, does feel like the more powerful Dean to me. He gives you access to the top card of your opponent's library, provided it's a spell, and he lets you cast it with mana of any color. So, basically, he draws you a card every turn, and gets bigger when you cast them. So, I think Nasari is the side that really pushes this particular pair of Deans into bomb range, but obviously they're both pretty good giving them an A-. Our last blue-red card is from the Mystical Archive, and it's Electrolyze, which costs one generic, a blue, and a red for a rare instant, and it deals two damage divided as you choose among one or two targets. Draw a card. I've loved this card in the past when we've seen it. It has three for one potential, provided your opponent has two X1s, and that's pretty awesome. Most of the time, you'll have to be content with just two for one, but I'm on board for that too. Sometimes, it won't be able to kill stuff if the opponent has big creatures, but in limited, it is likely to have something it can kill in most cases, and you can just electrolyze your opponent's face if you really need to draw a card and, you know, also do some damage. I think you can first pick this. I'm giving it a B. Right now, we're going to move to Silver Quill, which is black-white, and we're starting with Blot Out the Sky, which for X mana and a white and a black is a mythic rare sorcery, and it makes X tap two one white and black inkling creature tokens with flying. If X is six or more, destroy all non-creature, non-land permanents. After you get past paying 1 mana for X, this card will always give you your mana's worth. 4 mana for 2 to 1 flyers is quite the deal, as is 5 mana for 3, and so on. Now, they do come into play tapped, which means they can't really save you if you're in a big bind, because you're going to have to get to untap. It is also pretty cool that if you cast it for 8, you can blow up enchantments and artifacts and the like. Keep in mind that effect is symmetrical, so don't pay six or more for it if you have some non-creature, non-land cards you want to keep around. This is a really strong card, even if it is a little bit clunky. Not being able to block with them right away will be a problem sometimes, but I still feel like often enough, you'll be in a situation where if you're allowed to untap after you cast this, you're just going to win with all the evasive damage that you have. I think this is still a bomb. It would have been a bigger one if the Inklings came into play untapped because it could save you even in a super dire situation, and as is, it can't quite do that. Still, giving it an A-. Next up, it's Closing Statement, which for three generic, a black, and a white is an uncommon instant, and it says this spell costs two less to cast during your instep. Destroy target creature or planeswalker you don't control. Put a plus one plus one counter on up to one target creature you control. This is a great uncommon. A 5 mana instant that kills a thing and puts a counter on one of your creatures is already premium. It improves your board while subtracting from your opponents, and in some situations you may even find yourself getting a 2 for 1. If the plus and plus 1 counter gets put on a creature you have who can now win combat. Then you add in the fact that if you use this in the instep it only costs 3 and we're talking about even more serious power. That does take away the 2 for 1 potential, but sometimes that'll be the right thing to do anyway. This might be the best uncommon in the set. I'm giving it a B+. Next up, it's Dramatic Finale, which costs 4 black-white hybrid mana. It's a rare enchantment, and creature tokens you control get plus 1, plus 1. 
And it says, whenever one or more non-token creatures you control die, create a 2-1 white and black inkling creature token with flying. This ability triggers only once each turn. So even if you have zero other creature tokens, this makes it so that when you have a non-token creature die, you get a 3-2 flyer, at least the first time a non-token creature dies on your turn. That's already a pretty good deal as it will allow you to both attack and trade aggressively since getting a 3-2 flyer is pretty much equivalent to a whole card. Sometimes this won't line up well for you to use something like this, but the additional token upside makes it pretty darn good, giving it a B. Next up, it's Exhilarating Elocution, which for two generic, a white and a black is a common sorcery, and it says put two plus and plus one counters on target creature you control. Other creatures you control get plus one plus one until end of turn. This is a pretty nice boost to one creature. It'll be plus three, plus three total to one of them. And then, of course, the rest of the board is pump two, and some of those counters stay around on the first creature. This can enable a pretty nice attack, but it does really need a significant board state to ever be worthwhile. It's a little too situational to be anything special, but I'm giving it a C. Next up, it's Fracture, which for a white and a black mana is an uncommon instant, and it says destroy target artifact, enchantment, or planeswalker. This format doesn't really have enough of these three permanent types, so this is best left in your sideboard. It's probably a D if you have to play it in your main deck, and a C out of your sideboard. Next up, it's Humiliate, which for a white and a black is an uncommon sorcery. It says target opponent reveals their hand. You choose a non-land card from it. That player discards that card. Put a plus and plus one counter on a creature you control. Now this is how you design a good discard spell for limited. First, it lets you take whatever you want for a very efficient cost of 2 mana that's going to allow for a significant disruption. What really saves this though is the fact that you get a plus and plus 1 counter out of the deal too. Most discard spells get terrible in the extreme late game, but this makes sure that you get some value out of it no matter what, and it can be some pretty significant value. I think this is a discard spell you can actually first pick in some weaker packs. I'm giving it a B-. Next up, it's Inkling Summoning, which for one generic and two black-white hybrid mana is a common sorcery lesson, and it makes a 2-1 white and black Inkling creature token with flying. This lesson is nice because it isn't a complete disaster if you don't get any cards with learn and play it in your main deck. A 3-mana 2-1 with flying is just fine, and this also triggers Magecraft, of course. I'd say this is like a C- in your main deck, and a B- is something to find when you learn. Learning for something that will change the board is pretty meaningful because not all the cards you learn for will do it. Next up, it's Killian, Ink Duelist, who for a white and a black is a 2-2 legendary human warlock and uncommon. He has lifelink and menace, and spells you cast that target a creature cost two less to cast. This is pretty amazing. I would have been reasonably happy with a 2-mana two 2-2 two two with lifelink and menace, or a 2-mana two 2-2 two two with the spell reduction ability, but this has all of it. It is going to give you a lot for 2 mana. It will attack well early and then make most of your spells cheaper. Your removal spells will be cheaper as well as your tricks, by the way. Black-White is more of a color pair about tricks, but his ability also counts creatures that are targeted on your opponent's side of the table when you're casting the spell. This is a very strong signpost in common, one that I think you first pick pretty often. I'm giving it a B. Next up, it's Owlin Shield Mage, which for three generic, a white and a black, is a 3-3 bird warlock at common. It's got flying, and its ward causes your opponent to pay three life when they target it with a spell or ability, or that spell or ability is countered. Making the opponent pay three life to target this means you're likely to get some value out of this one way or another, and that seems fine to me. I'm giving this a C. Next up, it's Rise of Extus, which for four generic and two black-white hybrid mana is a common sorcery. It says exile target creature. Exile up to one target instant or sorcery card from a graveyard and learn. I mentioned this when we were talking about lessons. In addition to having the ability to grab you a lesson out of your sideboard, you can also choose to rummage, which means discard a card and draw a card. This is expensive and clunky, but it also isn't super far away from being a removal spell that has draw a card added to it. Now granted, most of the cards you can get with learn aren't exactly going to be world beaters, but they are still cards and adding that effect to a removal spell seems pretty nice. Exiling an instant or sorcery doesn't hurt either. Because learn is a new thing, it is a little difficult figuring out how to rate some of these, but I do feel like this falls well short of premium removal, even with learn. The thing you kill with it will virtually always cost less than it does, and I'm not sure the lesson you get or the rummage effect is enough to make up for that. I think this is just a C. Next up, it's Shadewing Laureate, which for one white, one black-white hybrid mana, and one black mana is a 2-2 human warlock at uncommon. It's got flying, and whenever another creature you control with flying dies, put a plus and plus one counter on target creature you control. Black-white has a significant number of flyers, including the Inkling creature tokens. This will allow the Laureate to put counters on things reasonably often, and that's to go along with Windrake stats. Plus and plus one counters are a theme which in black-white, as we've seen, so there's some extra synergy there too giving this a B-. 
Next up, it's Shadrick's Silver Quill, which for three generic, a white and a black, is a 2-5 Elder Dragon Mythic Rare. It's got flying and double strike, and at the beginning of combat on your turn, you may choose to. Target player creates a 2-1 white and black Inkling creature token with flying. Target player draws a card and loses one life. Target player puts a plus and plus one counter on each creature they control. This is a good card, albeit one with kind of a weird effect. A 5-mana 2-5 with flying and double strike is already great. Then he gives you a powerful effect every combat if you want him to. To go that route, you also have to give your opponent an effect that isn't irrelevant either. Now, you are the one who gets to decide which one they get and which one you get, and you can always pick the option that most benefits you and the one that least benefits them. But no matter what you're giving them, they're going to be getting something reasonably nice. Most of the time, I would imagine if you're wide enough, you'll give yourself the counters and let them draw a card, for example. Giving them the flyers seems bad, since it gives them a free way to block Shadricks, but sometimes giving them counters will be fine too, because their board is small. It's a good thing that his effect is a May effect, because there would be board states where you have to give your opponent something and you really don't want to. But if that's the situation, if that's how things are looking, you just decide not to use that ability and just be happy with your 5-mana 2-5 with flying and double strike. Still, I think the fact that you can line this ability up on most turns to give yourself something really good and give your opponent something minimally helpful is enough to make Shadrix into a bomb. It doesn't hurt either that he's just got great base stats as a 5-mana 2-5 with flying and double strike, giving him an A-. minus. Next up, it's Silver Quill Apprentice, which for a white and a black is a 2-2 human warlock at Uncommon. It's got Magecraft, and target creature gets plus 1, plus 0 until end of turn when you trigger it. So getting a bonus when you play spells is great, and this obviously pushes you in an aggressive direction, and that is a big part of what black and white is. But the boost here is so small. Plus one, plus zero just isn't going to be enough to help creatures win combat or anything like that. It will be pretty nice with tricks because you get an additional boost and things like that, but I think this is just a C. Next up, it's Silver Quill Command, which for two generic, a white, and a black is a rare sorcery, and it says choose two. Target creature gets plus three, plus three, and gains flying until end of turn. Return target creature card with mana value two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Target player draws a card and loses one life, and target opponent sacrifices a creature. Here, you have four effects that all can be pretty nice. Sometimes a plus three, plus three, and flying effect will help you win the game out of nowhere, and the fact it can also draw you a card is pretty nice too. I think choosing the edict option and drawing will be the most common thing you do with this. This, and that means this will give you a two for one often enough, but I think I'm pretty happy with it. You also get a two for one, by the way, if you choose the draw a card option and the edict effect and so forth. There are lots of different ways to get value. You know, the plus three plus three in flying and the reanimate a small creature effect probably won't come up as often, but they're both still pretty good in the right situation. I think this is a B. Next up, it's Silver Quill Pledge Mage, which for one generic and two black white hybrid mana. Is a 3-1 Vampire Cleric a common, it's got Magecraft, and you choose Flying or Lifelink until end of turn, and the Pledge Mage gains it. This dies to pretty much everything, but it has a nice enough Magecraft effect. Giving this Flying will frequently be the option you go with, as this attacks relatively hard in the air. Note, by the way, that if you cast two spells, you can choose both options, which will be particularly nice sometimes. This seems like a solid playable to me, I'm giving it a C. Next up, it's Silver Quill Silencer, which for a white and a black is a 3-2 human cleric at uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, you choose a non-land card name, and when an opponent casts a spell with the chosen name, they lose three life and you draw a card. So this starts out with some nice aggressive stats, and then it has a pretty interesting ability, one that's always interesting to evaluate in limited. Sometimes you just won't have any idea what you want to name with that effect, and that makes things kind of difficult, especially if you want to play this on turn two and you're in the first game of best of three or you're just playing best of one. Knowing what to name based on your opponent's like one land isn't going to be easy. That said, in a lot of ways it gets better as the game goes on when it becomes easier to predict what your opponent might be doing based on the colors they're playing, and this will become increasingly easy as people sort of solve this limited format and start to really know better what should and shouldn't be played, what the best cards are, what the key cards are for each archetype when those things become really clear the silencer will get a little better but in the really early going in the format it's going to be tough to name stuff that said it does work well against lessons because your opponent has to show you the lesson that they get so playing the silencer and naming a lesson does seem pretty good and you can still manage to hit cards often enough especially if you're playing best of two or best of three you'll be able to get a card out of the deal and make your opponent lose some life often enough you shouldn't expect it to happen all the time, it's just not. It's going to be, I don't know, between 10 and 20% of the time you'll be able to effectively name something. If you played something, well, you see your opponent's hand, that obviously goes up a little bit. And there are ways to do that in black-white. 
Still, I think this is just a creature with good stats that has an upside that will only trigger on a Cajun. I'm giving it a C+. Next up, it's Spiteful Squad, which for two generic, a white and a black, is a 0-0 human warlock at common. It's got death touch. It enters the battlefield with two plus and plus one counters on it. When it dies, you put its counters on target creature you control. Four mana 2-2s two with death touch normally aren't the most exciting thing in the world. They can trade for anything, but doing that at four mana isn't exactly exciting. You do get compensated for that here, though, by letting the band put its at least two plus and plus one counters and other stuff when it dies. This also means that it's a good place to put counters since it will do something with them when it dies, unlike most creatures. I think this seems like a solid enough card. I'm giving it a C+. Next up, it's Vanishing Verse, which costs a white and a black for a rare instant, and it says Exile Target Monocolored Permanent. So this set does have a lot of multicolored stuff, but there's plenty of monocolored too. This can deal with a lot of stuff in this format efficiently, and that's enough for it to be an easy first pick and certainly premium removal, giving it a B. All right, now we're moving into the double-faced modal cards for black white, where we have Selfless Glyph Weaver, which costs two generic and a white for a two, three human cleric at rare, and you can exile it to give your board indestructible until it turn your creatures anyway. And Deadly Vanities on the other side, it costs five generic and three black, and it says choose a creature or planeswalker, then destroy all other creatures and planeswalkers. Obviously, the creature side is where you're going to end up with this a lot of the time. At worst, it lets you save a key creature from removal, and at best, it can sit around on the board, threatening to make stuff indestructible during combat. Deadly Vanity is a sweeper, and one that lets you hold on to a creature, so you're always going to come out ahead there. If you cast it, you're just going to win, but casting it isn't easy or anything like that. But the fact it's on the other side of an already quite nice card means you can play the super powerful sweeper in your deck without the downside of getting it stuck in your hand in games where, you know, you're never going to be able to cast it. I think this is a B plus. Next up, it's Shale, Dean of Radiance, which for one generic and a white is a rare legendary bird cleric. It's got flying and vigilance, and you can tap it to put a plus and plus one counter on each creature that entered the battlefield under your control this turn. The other side is Ambrose, Dean of Shadow, and you can tap him. He's a 4-4, and you can tap him to put a plus and plus one counter on another target creature. Then Ambrose, Dean of Shadows, deals two damage to that creature, and whenever a creature you control with a plus and plus one counter on it dies, you draw a card. Like all of these Deans, both sides here are quite good. Shale's ability to put counters on new creatures is quite nice, especially because with Flying and Vigilance, Shale can get an attack in before using the ability. Also a great place to put plus and plus one counters because of those keywords. Meanwhile, Ambrose is a little bit weirder of a card, but he has a lot to offer. He can make your creatures bigger with his first ability, though you'll normally want to make sure it can survive the two damage. So in other words, it has to have at least two toughness before the counter. He'll also be able to pick off opposing X1s with that ability, which is nice additional flexibility. Then the plus and plus one counter payoff is quite nice, as drawing a card any time one of your creatures dies with a plus and plus one counter on it will give you a two for one virtually every time one of them dies. It also gives you a reason to use his ability on one of your own X1s because you really need to draw a card. But yeah, this is another case where both sides are quite good. I think this is a B+. And our Mystical Archive card for Black White is Despark, which for one white and a black is a rare instant. And it says Exile Target Permanent with mana value 4 or greater. This can target a bunch of stuff, and when it can exile something, it'll feel pretty good. But not hitting small things can be a liability sometimes. Still, I think it's premium removal. I'm giving it a B-. Next up, it's Extus Orik Overlord which is a modal double face card where the other side is Awaken the Blood Avatar. I have him kind of separate from the rest of Black White because he's a double face modal card who has something on the other side that no other card in this set is, and that is a card that costs allied colors of mana, so black, red. And, you know, the rest of this set is all about the five schools, all of which are enemy colors. So Exus Auric Overlord costs one generic, a white and two black for a 2-4 human warlock at Mythic Rare. It's got double strike and its Magecraft lets you return a non-legendary creature card from your graveyard to your hand. The other side is Awaken the Blood Avatar, which costs six generic, a black and a red for a sorcery. And as an additional cost to cast it, you may sacrifice any number of creatures. This spell costs two less to cast for each creature sacrificed this way. Each opponent sacrifices a creature. Create a 3-6 black and red avatar creature token with haste and... Whenever this creature attacks, it deals 3 damage to each opponent. So the X2 side here is really strong. A 4 mana 2-4 with double strike is already playable and his magecraft ability makes all of your instants and sorceries get you back a creature from the graveyard to your hand, which is amazing upside. Awaken the Blood Avatar isn't terrible, but it's definitely weaker than X2 is going to be. Casting it for 8 isn't so good, but if you can even sacrifice one creature and cast it for 6, I think it will feel pretty nice. You get a 3-6 with haste and a powerful attack trigger, and you make your opponent sack a creature. 
If this was just Awaken the Blood Avatar, this would probably be like a C plus. You know, this format does have pest tokens, which will make it easier to pull off. And in some ways it's kind of weird because the black red side of this is probably actually better in the black green deck as opposed to the black white one. But either way, it takes significant setup. It's not like the avatar you get out of the deal is unbeatable either. So that wouldn't be that great if it was all on its own. It would be certainly good, but not incredible. Still, you know, you have x on one side who's quite good, and there will be situations where it just makes sense to do Awaken the Blood Avatar because your opponent's at like six, and they only have one blocker or something like that, or no blockers, and just casting Awaken the Blood Avatar will win you the game in those situations. So there will be times where that comes up. I'm giving this an A-. minus. All right, now we've covered all of the colored cards in Strixhaven. Now let's move to the colorless ones. And we're starting with several colorless lessons. Now they're colorless, they're not artifacts, those are different things, but they are colorless, they don't cost colored mana. First up, we have Environmental Sciences, which for two generic mana is a common sorcery lesson, and it says search your library for a basic land card, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle, you gain two life. Pretty much all of these common colorless lessons have a minor effect that won't always be worth the mana, but because you can grab them when you learn, it doesn't really matter. This is actually kind of good at fixing too, especially because it's colorless. I can see there being times where you don't have any learn cards that you just end up main boarding and environmental science. Like if you have one card with learn and you have two environmental sciences, put one in your sideboard and put one in your deck. I could see that happening because it does fix for you and it's colorless. And if you want to splash something, this isn't a bad way to do it. It also gains you life, which is especially good in the black green deck because you can get some additional value out of it. Overall, I'd say this is a C- in your main deck, and a C- plus is a card you can get out of your sideboard. Next up, we have Expanded Anatomy, which costs 3 generic mana for a sorcery lesson. You put 2 plus and plus 1 counters on target creature, and it gains Vigilance until end of turn. Again, this is not a card you would normally play in your main deck in most situations, but it's basically free if you play a card with Learn. In a lot of ways, these cards that have Learn will feel like reasonable cards with an inefficient but useful mana sync ability. That's kind of what these are going to feel like. The cards with Learn all already do a thing, and then they also get you one of these mediocre cards. But again, it's a free card, so I'm down with it. This is a D in your main deck, and a C is something to get out of your sideboard. Next up, it's Introduction to Annihilation, which costs 5 generic mana for a common sorcery lesson. It says Exile Target Nonland Permanent. Its controller draws a card. Exiling any non-land permanent is nice, but being 5 mana and sorcery speed and still giving your opponent a card back is pretty rough. Meanwhile, if you keep this in your sideboard, it gets a lot better because if you play a card with Learn to get it, you're netting a card, and in the end, just breaking even with this when your opponent draws their own card. And the fact that it can deal with anything is definitely a big deal. This is a D plus if you have to play it in your main deck, but much better in your sideboard as a C plus. Next up, it's Introduction to Prophecy, which costs three generic mana for a common sorcery lesson, and it says Scry to then draw a card. So this is a lesson card that you will basically always want to leave in your sideboard. Bring it in your deck as a real card isn't very appealing. It's clunky and doesn't do enough for three mana, but it does trigger Magecraft and replace itself, so it has some value. Basically, I'd say this is a D plus if you have to play it in your main deck, and a C is a card to get out of your sideboard. And our last of these colorless lessons is Mascot Exhibition, which costs seven generic mana for a mythic rare sorcery lesson. It creates a 2-1 white and black inkling creature token with flying, a 3-2 red and white spirit creature token, and a 4-4 blue and red elemental creature token. Flavor-wise, this bothers me a little bit, you know, because there are five colleges, each of which has a mascot, but only three of the colleges are represented at this exhibition. You should also be getting a pest and a fractal. I don't know why they didn't do that. Maybe it would have been too good or they wanted to keep it at a lower mana cost. I don't know. So flavor aside, this is a pretty good card. Two of the five main archetypes in this set are ramp decks. And that goes a long way towards making this card better than it looks. You pay a lot of mana here, but you do add significantly to the board too, with a grand total of 9-7 worth of stats across three bodies. This gets a further upgrade because it's a lesson, and that's probably what you want to be doing with it the most. You don't really want to draw this early, even in a ramp deck, and if you have ways to to learn to grab it from your sideboard you don't have to worry about that happening so it really mitigates significantly against one of the key downsides of a card like this i do think you can main deck this card without feeling terrible about it you definitely would rather have it in your sideboard as something you can grab when you learn you can increase your chances of finding it if you have like two cards with learn and put it in your sideboard as opposed to just putting it in your main deck Still, it is probably the most main deckable or close to it of all of the different lessons in this format, just because there are ramp decks in this format, and what it does is actually reasonably powerful. I'm going to give it a C plus as a main deck card, 
But as a card to get as a lesson, it's probably a B plus. You know, most of the lessons you can grab aren't going to feel like win conditions. This basically is. And that's a big deal. Next up, it's Wandering Archaic, which for five colorless mana is a 4-4 Avatar at rare. Whenever an opponent casts an instant or sorcery spell, they may pay two generic mana. If they don't, you may copy that spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. The other side is Explore the Vast Lands, which for three generic mana is a rare sorcery, and it says each player looks at the top five cards of their library, reveals a land card and or an instant or sorcery card from among them, then puts the cards they reveal this way into their hand and the rest on the bottom of their library in a random order. Each player gains three life. So mostly you're going to be wanting to play the creature side of this. This set has a lot of instants and sorceries, so your opponent is going to have to pay this tax a lot, or you'll be getting free copies of their spells, which is pretty freaking insane. In fact, this being in play sometimes, and frequently really, will just make your opponent not cast their spells, which is fine with me. Explore the Vast Lands is a symmetrical effect, so it is sort of like you and your opponent break even on the cards in life, but your opponent will get to untap and have more mana available to use it, and they also didn't pay mana or use a card to do their drawing like you did. It is nice you can do the Explore the Vast Lands thing in situations where you really just need to find a specific card or the three life, so it is upside, but you're going to play the Avatar side of this like 99% of the time. I think it sneaks into the lower range of being a bomb as an A-. minus. All right, let's move now to Artifacts. First, it's Biblioplex Assistant, which for four generic mana is a 2-1 Artifact Creature Gargoyle at common. It's got flying. When it enters the battlefield, you put up to one target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard on top of your library. This is an all right way to get back a powerful spell, and the creature you get isn't the most disastrous thing ever either. It may even be able to attack in the sky, but remember, putting a card back on top is way worse than putting it into your hand. Still, this will make the cut often enough to be a C-. Next, it's Campus Guide, which for two generic mana is a 2-1 artifact creature golem at common, and when it enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a basic land card, reveal it, then shuffle and put that card on top. This is kind of comparable to the Biblioplex Assistant we just saw. It has passable stats, and it can get you a card. In this case, it fixes for you. But again, keep in mind, you're not really getting it in your hand. You're putting it on top of your library, which is substantially worse. Still, if you're trying to do some splashing, this will help you do it. If you're not splashing at all, it probably isn't worth playing. I'm giving it a C-. Next up, it's Cody, Vociferous Codex, which for three colorless mana is a 1-4 legendary artifact creature construct at rare. It says you can't cast permanent spells. And you can pay four generic and tap it to add Wooburg, one mana of every color, to your mana pool. When you cast your next spell this turn, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile an instant or sorcery card with lesser value. Until end of turn, you may cast that card without paying its mana cost. Put each other card exiled this way in the bottom of your library in a random order. This is a weird card, and one that's kind of hard to evaluate without playing it. Not being able to cast permanent spells is a pretty big cost, and I'm not really sure Cody's ability does enough to help that not completely sink you. Cody's ability doesn't help you get permanence, and sure, there are lots of spells in this format, including those that make permanence, but chances are good your deck will have more permanent than non-permanent spells. Cody does give you some pretty weird fixing for all of your non-permanent spells, in addition to the free card every turn you can cast something. But if you're drawing permanent spells that are dead cards, it's all kind of a wash. I don't think this is completely unplayable. I can see this really grinding out games where the game has sort of gone to parody and the game's going long. I can see Cody getting it done for you there. But I do think it's going to be tricky in most decks to really set this up to get you there in any other situation. Giving this a C. Next up, it's Cogwork Archivus, which for six generic mana is a four or five artifact creature construct at common. It's got reach. You can pay two and tap it to put a card from a graveyard on the bottom of its owner's library. Mostly, you're not going to play this. It has mediocre stats and an unexciting ability. The ability might be a little more useful in the red-white deck, which likes it when things leave the graveyard, but mostly, using this ability is underwhelming. Now, if games in this format go long and you're out of cards and you can legit use this to draw the best card in your graveyard every turn, then it will be better than that, but it's hard to count on this being a format that'll do that. I'm giving this a D-. Next up, it's Excavated Wall, which for one generic is a 0-4 artifact creature wall at common. It's got Defender, and you can pay one generic mana and tap it to mill a card. One mana 0-4 Defenders tend to not really be worth it in Limited, and this one does help you load your graveyard, which red-white decks will like, but I still don't really think that's going to be enough for me to run this most of the time. I'm giving it a D. Next up, it's Letter of Acceptance, which for three generic mana is an artifact at common. You can tap it to add one mana of any color, and you can pay two generic and tap it to sacrifice it and draw a card. 
This gives you reasonable fixing, and once you don't need that, you can cash it in for a card, which is nice. We see cards like this a lot, and the decks that need fixing will run them, but it is unlikely anyone else will. I'm giving this a C-. Next up, it's Reflective Golem, which costs 3 generic mana for a 2-3 artifact creature golem at Uncommon. It says whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell that targets only Reflective Golem, you may pay 2 mana. If you do copy that spell, you may choose new targets for that copy. So a 3 mana 2-3 is not great, and his ability is useful, especially with combat tricks. One thing that really bothers me about it is it won't work with fight spells. Like That, I think, would have really made this significantly better, because there's at least 2 fight spells in green at lower rarities, and copying those would have felt pretty good. But you can't, because they target more than one thing. So really, you're stuck with tricks and targeting your Reflective Golem with them, and then sort of paying a kicker cost of two to get another copy of that spell. And don't get me wrong, that will pan out sometimes, but it takes a very specific deck composition, and most likely that'll be at its best in like black-white, which is the color they're most interested in being sort of aggressive with spells. But you really do need the right deck composition, or this is just a subpar creature. I'm giving it a C. Next up, it's Spell Satchel, which for two generic mana is an uncommon artifact with Magecraft that puts a book counter on it. You can tap it and remove a book counter to add colorless mana to your mana pool, and you can pay three generic and tap it to remove three book counters from Spell Satchel and draw a card. So this is a mana rock that asks you to fulfill the condition of casting spells, which isn't going to be that hard, but it does concern me a little bit. One nice thing about it is that in the late game when you really don't need the mana, you can save up book counters and start drawing cards with it, but this format would have to be glacial for this card to be really good. It is a two mana mana rock, and that's nice, but I just don't think you'll be able to tap it for mana consistently and often enough for it to really feel like a two mana mana rock. I'm going to give it a C minus and honestly I could see it going even lower. Next up it's Strixhaven Stadium which for three generic mana is a rare artifact. You can tap it to add colorless and put a point counter on Strixhaven Stadium. Whenever a creature deals combat damage to you remove a point counter from Strixhaven Stadium. Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to an opponent put a point counter on Strixhaven Stadium. Then if it has 10 or more point counters on it, remove them all, and that player loses the game. So they did it. They modeled a card after Quidditch. This is a Quidditch-themed card. They did it here. You know, if the Harry Potter theme wasn't strong enough, now we're really seeing it. Anyway, alternate win condition cards do not have a good track record in Limited. You just won't be able to end up in a deck that really effectively utilizes this card. Plus, it's sort of win more anyway. If you can get the 10 point counters, chances are your opponent's dead anyway. It is also a mana rock, and I think that saves it from an F, but I don't think it can go higher than a D-. Next up, it's Team Pennant, which for one generic mana is an uncommon artifact equipment. The equipped creature gets plus and plus one and has Vigilance and Trample. If you equip it to a creature token, it only costs one to equip, and to anything else, it costs three. So equipping this on a non-token isn't an awesome rate, but it's not entirely terrible either. Vigilance and Trample and plus one plus one is a nice boost to get and will often alter your plans and your opponents. This format does have a lot of creature tokens, as we've seen throughout the week, with every color pair having a mascot creature token. And because of that, you'll actually be able to equip it cheaply pretty often, and that's going to be a really good deal. I mean, if you can consistently have this be one mana to play, one mana to equip, it's going to be really nice. And I think this will do that often enough that I'm willing to give this a C+. Our last artifact is Zephyr Boots, which costs one generic mana for an uncommon artifact equipment. Equip creature has flying, and when that creature deals combat damage to a player, you loot. You draw a card and then discard a card, and it has an equipped cost of two. This is a nice equipment. Flying tends to be a pretty nice boost in just about any creature, and it gives that boost at a reasonable rate already. But the loot combat damage trigger is really what makes this card into something you can take with the first pick. I'm giving it a B-. minus. You can drastically improve your draws if that's what you do. Now we're moving to lands. First up we have Access Tunnel, which is an uncommon land that you can tap for colorless mana, and you can pay three generic and tap it to make a creature with power three or less unblockable until end of turn. This has some decent utility in the late game. It's not great for your mana, so you can't really run it if your mana base is looking a little sketchy, but I think if your mana base is looking good, you basically always run one of these. Um, I'm going to give it a C. You know, it's a land that in the late game turns into something that actually damages your opponent more or less, and that can't be said of most lands. Next up, we have Archway Commons, which is a common land that enters the battlefield tapped, and when it enters the battlefield, you have to sacrifice it unless you pay one, and it can tap for one mana of any color. So this gives you fixing, but at a pretty real cost. It enters tapped and requires another land to tap for it to come into play, effectively making it cost one mana. You don't want to be playing one mana for a land, right? That's some serious slowness, but you will run it if you need fixing. I'm giving it a C-. 
Next, it's the Biblioplex, which is a rare land that taps for colorless mana. And you can pay two generic and tap it to look at the top card of your library. If it's an instant or sorcery card, you may reveal it and put it into your hand. If you don't put the card into your hand, you may put it into your graveyard. Activate only if you have exactly zero or seven cards in hand. This card makes a fun little reference to the first time Wizards printed a land that represented a library, Library of Alexandria, but suffice it to say, this time around this isn't quite as good, but it is still a really great utility land. Holding out of seven cards is going to be a challenge in Limited, so most of the time you'll find yourself using the Biblioplex when you're out of cards. Basically, it'll give you a good mana sink that'll give you an extra draw if you like top deck a land, for example. Decks in this format will have more spells than we're used to seeing too, so it will draw you a card pretty often late. That's huge late game upside that can often win you the game. That's always true when one of your lands turns into a value engine. I think you can first pick this, I'm giving it a B. Next up we have the Snarl Lands. There's one of these for every single college at Strixhaven. They're all rare, and when they enter the battlefield you reveal, in the case of Frostboil Snarl, for example, an Islander Mountain card from your hand. If you don't, it enters the battlefield tap, and it can tap for either blue or red mana. So these are good fixing, and they'll help you splash. Don't underestimate how nice it is, even in a two-color deck, to have one land that can produce either color. It is really great for your mana base. You should never be first picking these, but I think you should value them over most medium cards and packs if you're in one or both of the colors it produces. That means I'm giving this a C plus collectively to all five of these. Next up, it's Hall of Oracles, which is a rare land that taps for colorless mana. You can pay one generic and tap it to add one mana of any color, and you can tap it to put a plus and plus one counter on target creature, activate only as a sorcery, and only if you've cast an instant or sorcery spell this turn. While filtering isn't incredible, the fact that it fixes your mana for you and can start putting counters on your creatures is pretty great. Having a land that turns into an effect that actually changes your board in the late game is going to feel really good. This is another nice card you can first pick. I'm giving it a B. All right, and the last thing to look at is the campus cycle. Each college has one of these. They all enter the battlefield tapped. They all tap for red or white mana, and they all have an activated ability that lets you pay four generic and tap it to scry one. These are all good fixing, and they all have a nice late game mana sink to help improve your draws when you're flooding out. You can take these over most medium cards, especially if you're interested in splashing or they're on color for you. I'm giving this a C+. Well, that completes the card by card set review for Strixhaven, but there's still one last video in this review, and that's the guide to the format's archetypes, which will be going up tomorrow. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future set reviews, draft videos, and other magic content, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. And if you're looking for the rest of this review, you should see the playlist on your screen now. Thanks for watching.